Okay. All right. So welcome to week whatever it is <laughs> with uh, 1 Samuel verses tw or chapter 21 through 31. So um, I guess let's start with some prayer and uh, see where we go from there. So Lord, thank you for this day and for this opportunity to study your word and to learn more about David and um, who he was and how he was obedient to you. Lord, a man who is after your own heart. And I just pray in this time that you would encourage us to become men and women after your heart, uh, that we would grow closer to you in every way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I guess I'll start out like Pastor Eric does and ask if there's any particular questions and then we'll go from there. I just have a question. Whoops, where's my questions? Well, I'm gonna have two, but they're later on. So when we get there, I'll ask them. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're hopping around. <laughs> it was a fun week to prepare for. I actually really like this section of David's life. Um, I feel like he is so very much dependent on the Lord because he has this massive promise of you will be king, but he's experiencing this massive issue of the king wants to kill you and you better run for your life. <laughs> and so it's this interesting dichotomy of future and present. Um, mm -hmm. And how do you respond to that? And um, it's really encouraging to me as to how he responds. So, all right, let's start out in chapter 21. So, um, uh, this, so this is right following last week. I think we read about um, uh, David and Jonathan and how um, Jonathan was trying to find out whether or not uh, David was... Um, really in trouble with Saul because Jonathan thought that Saul didn't actually have any bad intentions towards him. Um, and so they ended up finding out that yes, indeed, Saul did want to destroy uh, David. And so they said their goodbyes and uh, David takes off. Um, some interesting things that I found out, I don't know if Pastor Rick ever mentioned this before, <clears throat> but in my study of it, I, I hadn't realized this before. Jonathan is actually 27 years older than David. Oh. Hmm. So during the time of this section that we're going to read, David is from 22 years old to 30 years old um, during these uh, 11 chapters. And um, so Jonathan is um, a what, 49 years old at the start of this? Hmm. That's interesting. So, yeah. So I'm wondering, I mean, they were friends, but now I'm wondering because of the age difference, if, if he was more like a mentor in some ways. Yeah. Too. I mean, I don't know, you know, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting that, you know, they, they got really close, obviously, but yeah, that Jonathan was so much older and the king's son, you know, and that David, this young man, had this massive impact on him. So, um, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, also, um, King Saul would have been king for 27 years. Mm. Oh, one sec. I admit Tom. Um, he would have been king for 27 years prior to um, uh David even getting anointed by Samuel and then Samuel spent or S S David spent seven years with Saul um, so uh, you know Saul would have been by the time he's starting to hunt down David he would have been king for about 34 years um, so you know and David's just this young 22 year old upstart at that point so um, it, it gave it a different feeling to me because, you know, and I always thought of Jonathan and David as, you know, same age or maybe Jonathan even a little bit younger kind of looking up to David. And then when I found out, whoa, 27 years older, that's like. <laughs> Could have been his dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, here's another interesting thing. Uh, David or Saul was only 15 years old when he had Jonathan. So, 
Yeah. Mm. So they could have been his grandpa for that matter, potentially. Mm -hmm. If that's the age that they're doing this stuff. A at. soul was 15 years old when he had Jonathan. How do you find this stuff out? Wow, that's amazing. Huh? <laughs> um, you just you have to look through like they give little hints of you know. Oh, sorry, I have a cat that's going to be. In the <laughs> um, so they give hints as to um, you know. <laughs> when such and such happened then Saul was blah 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 year old and you know and so then if you look at that you can kind of figure out when people are alive, wow. around and alive. Um, also another interesting thing this is happening from 1018 BC to 1010 BC so this is approximately a thousand years before Christ which again at least for me it oftentimes i I don't realize or feel like David is only a thousand years before Christ. I, I feel like it's, you know, a couple thousand or something like that, because it seems like so much happens in that time period. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's constantly amazing to me how little time period there is between things, you know, that, that things happen. So, and just a thousand years prior to that, you have Noah. So it's an equal amount of time from Noah to David and from David to Christ. Hmm. So, wow. Interesting. Anyway, so I'll, uh, oh, hey, Rick, you're here. <laughs> Probably can hear you just. Uh, yep. <laughs> Guess you could take over now. <laughs> I guess. I can't hear it. Oh, we can't hear you. Can't you're hear muted. you. You're still muted. There it is. There you are. I'm not, I'm not muted now. Okay. I, had just, I just got inside and I was like, oh, crud, I hope I gave Jacqueline all the information to start the meeting and everything. I couldn't remember. Yep, you did. Okay. Yeah, I told him a whole bunch of stories about you when we were kids. And, you know. <laughs> and it's all recorded and on the cloud now. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm not really that worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> My uneventful childhood. <laughs> anyway. All right. So I, I don't know who's all here. Uh, the usual crowd. I've done zero prep, so you can go ahead and go. <laughs> yeah, I've done nothing. Okay. <clears throat> so um, in uh, Samuel chapter 21. Um, we start out with David, as I said, he's, he's fleeing after Jonathan, and um, he runs to the, um, the temp, well, the tabernacle where the priests are, to Nob, and uh, he goes to them, and he asks them for food and for weapons, um, and what he does here is, well, what the priest does is a little bit of a no-no. Um, he gives him what's called the showbread. Um, so inside the tabernacle, um, there is the outer court, which has the brazen altar where they make all their sacrifices. And then it has the lava or the Holy Sea, which is a huge basin for water um, where the priests got washed and people got washed ceremonially. And then you go into the holy place. Only the priests won't go into the holy place. And inside the holy place, you have on one side, you have a candle stand. Um, and then on the other side, uh, you have the um, showbread table. And then in front of you, you have an altar of incense. And the showbread table is a, a long table. And on it, you have 12 loaves of bread and a cup of wine. Um, and... Um, and on these 12 loaves of bread, um, it, they're supposed to stay in the presence of the Lord for a week. And then the priests are supposed to put fresh bread out at the end of the week. And then the priests are supposed to eat that bread. The, priest, uh, the, the sons of Aaron are supposed to eat that bread. And they have to eat it on Sabbath day. And then if, it's a, more than, if they don't eat it all, then they have to burn it. Um, and so this priest has this extra bread left over and instead of yeah. eating it or burning it, he gives it to David, which is 
no. Um, in uh, Leviticus 24, if you guys want to read further on that, um, in verses five through nine, it talks about uh, the showbread and how it's specifically for the priests. Um, so, and it says specifically, it says that this is the most holy part of the regular share of the offering for the priests. So it's the part that they should always treat with the utmost respect. Um, Cause they also get parts of um, like sacrifices of like sheep and, and, um, and pigeons and um, cows and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but the showbread is the holiest thing that they eat. Um, and so it's very interesting later on, uh, Jesus talks about this um, in the book of Mark. Um, he's going through the, um, the fields and uh, he and his disciples are hungry and they're just kind of picking off heads of wheat and eating them as they go through. And the, the um, priests and the, the Pharisees get upset with them about that and say, why are you doing this? You're, you're breaking the Sabbath. And uh, he says, haven't you read about David and how he was given the showbread to eat? and it wasn't held against him. And then he says, um, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, and so it, it's an unusual thing. And I, I don't know, it, there's a lot of speculation as to how those two things correlate other than that um, something that was deigned holy, you know, showbread and Sabbath, um, that man was allowed to um, do something with, and it's, it was okay. It wasn't going to be held against them as having gone against the law for some reason. So, um, there's a lot of questions about that. So that's something to, if you want to do some theological pondering, there's a point for you. <laughs> um, any thoughts or questions about that point? Um, the only question I had in 21 was, at seven, when it said, now one of Saul's servants was there that day detained before the Lord. What does it mean by detained? So one of the things that's thought about that is, you know, there's times where you have to go before priests or whatever because you're unclean for something and you have to get announced to be clean. And so they're thinking that possibly some sort of uncleanliness had come upon him and he, he needed to be pronounced clean, but we don't know for certain, you know, it's not exactly certain what is going on that he's being detained. Um, okay. So. The other yeah. question I had right after that was when he was looking for a weapon and the sword from Goliath was there, was it common again that they had weapons left over like that and they were just there or, and, you know, that it was Goliath who he killed and it was there. Is that I, point of sense? Yeah, I don't, I think that, um, I, you know, as the priest says, we don't really have weapons. Um, I think that this may have been just a special thing where, you know, this, this weapon was this big, heavy, crazy weapon. And, um, and so, you know, it, he like dedicated it to the Lord or gave it to the Lord um, to have, you know, as a, a special thing. And, you know, the, being that they keep it with the ephod, which is some that's like the special robes that the high priest wore. Um, so it was being kept in a place of, you know, where you keep something that's special or, or important. So I'm guessing it was just an offering to the Lord of, hey, cool, look what we have, you know. Yeah, sure. So there's not really a lot of other things mentioned about things like that being in the temple throughout the rest of the scripture that I have memory of. So um, I could be wrong because, you know, obviously my memory is not perfect, but. Um. <laughs> so any other questions about that little section and not just 21, because we're going to go on to David and Gath, um, but just the section about him being in the temple. Okay, um, so David runs from there and he goes to Gath, which is the town that Goliath is actually from. Um, so 
Um, and he goes to the king there um, and asks to be, you know, let into the court. And then once he gets there, all the people around him obviously start saying, hey, isn't this the guy that like killed Goliath and so many other um, Philistines? And he's like, "Uh oh, <laughs> so he tends to be insane. Um, and it says he, he marks the gates, um, which some people think that what he did was claw at them. Um, I wondered if it meant that he marked them like a dog would. I don't know. Um, but um, he, he definitely does think, you know, he lets spittle and drool go down his face. What um, was the purpose? I know that he, he um, was recognized and so he decided to be insane. So, but I don't understand the purpose why he, why he pretended that he was insane and was going psychotic. Because if he's insane, then he's not a danger. It's not like he's going to go around infiltrating and killing, you know, killing more the rocks. Things or, yeah, because, you know, they could have thought, oh, he, you know, he's come, he says he's going to be a part of our thing, and then he's going to slit the king's throat one night. Oh, know? okay. So if they just think he's crazy and harmless, you know, then they're like, well, you know, who cares what he does? Um, and two, it gave him a reason to leave. Um, without, you know, being in trouble, um, you know, because if he left, then they could have said, well, he's a spy or something like that. So they're just like, he's nuts. Get him out of here. Um, and it's really interesting. There's two Psalms that David writes during this time. Um, Psalm 34 and Psalm 56 are both written during the time that he is playing insane in, um, in, uh, yeah, in Gath. And um, <laughs> I think it's, it's very interesting. Psalm 34 is what's called an acrostic psalm. So he wrote a psalm that's not only like a song, but it is done with the Hebrew alphabet. So each line is the next letter in the alphabet. Uh -huh. So, you know, so you're not just writing a poem, you're writing a poem that is A, B, C, D, E, uh, you know, and so he's plain and sane, and yet he's writing this very, um, you know, difficult to write type piece, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and so I think that's a very interesting thing that his intellect is coming out. What was that song? What? 34. Okay. Yeah, and then Psalm 56 is the other psalm he writes during this time. Um, he, he, this is, he, David starts to write a lot of the psalms that are in scripture um, starting at this time. So as we go throughout, we're, we're going to see where he wrote different psalms at. Um, but yeah. Um, and two, when you look at the psalms, um, at the top of the psalm, it'll say, you know, when David was insane, and then they'll say with Abimelech, I think it's a, or no, yeah, Abimelech. Um, and so, but you'll look in the, the thing, and it says that he is, the name of the king is Achish. And so the thing with that is Abimelech means uh, my father is king, or my father is the, or the king is my father, or stuff like that. So anyways, it's obvious father and Melech is king. Um, and it seems that Abimelech is a title that is given to Philistine kings. So there's five Abimelechs in the Bible and four of them are Philistine kings. So, um, so when you read that, what it just means is when I was with the, uh, Philistine king, um, even though he doesn't name him by name. So, um, so anyways, so... <laughs> All right, any further questions about David and Gath? All right, and let's go on. Um, so Samuel 22, uh, he, he leaves from Gath and he goes to a cave. Um, and when he goes there, it says, <laughs> I, I think this is an interesting part. It says his, his, his brothers and his father's household come to him. And also all those who are in distress 
debt or discontented? <laughs> and I think, what a great way to start as king. <laughs> 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 You're in charge of all your family, which is 11 older brothers. <laughs> and then everyone who's upset. <laughs> or broke. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, even though they may think you're cool right now, it's only a matter of time <laughs> before they're probably going to be upset with you, too. So, um, so I think it, this may have been a trial by fire for Daniel or for Daniel for uh, David in getting started as in uh, leading people. They picked them well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he didn't pick them; they gave to him. So, um, but it says uh, from there they went to Moab um, to try to keep uh, his family safe. So he he goes to Moab and he asks the king if his his parents at least can stay there with them, um, and just kind of a question. Do you guys know why he might have gone to Moab, which is not in Israel? So um, if you would remember back a couple weeks of when we read, David had a very famous grandmother whose name was Ruth. Oh. And Ruth was a Moabite. Mm -hmm. So he took them back to his, his grandma's place basically <laughs> and uh, to get them to be protected um so um and moab where uh the moabites were sons of lot so um so there would have been an even further back family connection but um but yeah so he goes to moab um but when he goes there um the prophet gad uh comes to him and says um you you need to you need to go back into Israel. You need to go back into Judah, um, and so he leaves from there. Um, now Gad is someone who is, seems to be a prophet through most of David's time. Uh, he starts out with him in the the you know when he's running around, and then he also comes back later on a couple times while David is king, um, and gives him pronouncements. Um, it is believed. Um, and I think it's mentioned in, uh, let's see, they said First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29, um, that Gad writes a biography of David's life. Um, some of that is thought to be found throughout the books of Samuel. Some of it is considered to be that those are the writings of Gad. Um, but um, for the majority, this book or chronicle of Gad um, is a lost book. Nobody knows where it is. We don't have any record of it. Um, so who knows? Maybe someday we'll find another cave that has the books of Gad in it. <clears throat> but there is another psalm written during this time. Um, psalm 63 is written during the time that uh, Gad comes and tells him to go into the forest. And so, um, so I think it's really kind of cool that we have all these psalms because <coughs> Now, you know, it, what we're reading is the history, but then in getting to read the Psalms, you get David's mindset of what he's experiencing and how he's thinking about things as he goes through things. So it makes David one of the most humanized people in the Bible, I think, because you hear him whining, <laughs> you hear him rejoicing, you, you hear his heart being poured out before the Lord. Um, and so it's just a great opportunity to hear more about who he is. And David is, uh, I think, other than Christ, he is the most reported person in the Bible. Um, there's more written about the life of David than anyone else. So, um, oh, another thing that I thought was interesting here is um, Gad, you'll see him referred to as a seer. Um, and um, so there is a difference between a seer and a prophet um, in the Bible. Um, so a prophet, uh, the word is na nabi, and it indicates someone who is a mouthpiece to the people. Um, so your job is 
you gain information from the Lord and then you're to be a mouth from to speak to the people what God is saying. Um, but a seer, the name is Ra'ah, and that literally, it talks about the connection between God and the person. Um, and it's about that their ability to see into the spiritual realm and see what's going on in heavenly situations. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see that later on with Gad um, in things that happen where he will see what's happening in the spiritual realm and then report on it. Um, so, um, and I bring that up because we're going to see the other side of a seer later on in this uh, set of chapters. So, um, let's see, what else do I have in here? Um, and then we get to, um, so during this chapter also you have uh, that doeg that we discussed earlier in the earlier chapter, the Edomite who is in the temple. And he comes and he reports to Saul what he saw, that, um, that the, the priest was talking to David, and Saul becomes very upset about that, and he orders for the priest to be killed. And, um, and all of his men, all the Israelites, they are like, uh, 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 we're not doing that. We're not killing, you know, God's priests. And so Saul looks to Doeg and says, well, you, you kill him. Um, and so Saul does that, or so Doeg does that. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about the Edomites, <clears throat> so they are the descendants of Esau. And God actually declares that all of Edom um, is, is at the end of time when he does judgments on nations, that Edom will be considered a wasteland and that will never be recovered, um, that they will never have the opportunity to uh, have anything grow in there again. Um, they'll just be a wasteland of nothingness. Um, and so uh, there seems to be some animosity between God and Edomites. And so Doag is true to that. And so he is perfectly fine with slaughtering all the priests in that family, mm. except for uh, Benatar. I'm trying to remember his name all of a sudden. Abimelech. Abimelech, who manages to make it out. Um, so uh, very telling. Oh, and David writes a psalm about this. <laughs> uh, psalm 52. He writes about the evil of Doag, how he's an e evil. evil. Um, so, um, any questions on First Samuel 22? Yeah, the question I had, and I think, it, what what's the stronghold? Are they talking about like the cave that he's in, or like a uh, uh, frame of mind that he's in? Yeah, so um, actually, it's very interesting, the strongholds that are around in there. Um, so there are some which they call migdals, which are like tower type structures. But there is all throughout Israel, and particularly in Judah, um, there are all these caves, um, it, massive cave systems. Um, and it was very, very common for them to have um, uh, fighting groups that lived in these caves or used these caves as places to um, hide out in or to um, rest in um, and to store supplies in. Um, and in fact, um, I read an interesting story about a, um, a gentleman, he's a, a Jew who um, his job is to uh, check through the Dead Sea Scrolls and to make sure that they're, that what we have in scripture is, is um, lines up in Hebrew scripture, modern Hebrew scripture lines up with what's in the um, Dead Sea Scrolls and any differences that there are in that. And he's a, a uh, 
ex, uh, scholar in that area of ancient Hebrew languages. And so he was going through, there's uh, this one particular place, I'm trying to remember where in the Bible it talks about it, but they talk about this um, one stronghold and they call it the birth canal or something like that. And he went out to see it and he talked about that the, the hole to enter this thing was so small that he said he, he got almost stuck the entire or going into it. And he said, you know, it was just like inch by inch. And he said he just was having a panic attack trying to get in through this hole. And then he went, you know, and once you got in, it was these massive caverns and it was really nice and he could walk around and, you know, see all this stuff. And he said when he had to come back, he was just like, oh my gosh, I have to go back out through this thing again. He said he almost had a panic attack, but because it has this narrow, narrow entrances. He said, you know, they look like little, um, like fox dens or something like that. They're just these tiny holes that you go in and then there's these massive caverns in there. And so those are all throughout that area. And so that's probably where David is at, is he's going into all these different caves and hiding in them. So. Well. Any other questions about that? Okay. So uh, chapter 23. So, um, so David is hanging out in these caves and, um, uh, now I forget his name again. Uh, the priest, uh, Abimelech, Abimelech. yes, Abimelech, um, Abimelech. Oh no, not that's the that's not Abimelech. Abimelech is the uh, the king. That's the reason why I'm. It's Abba. Where are we at? Anyways, it's the priest who escaped. He comes to. Um, to is David. it Abathar? Abathar, yes, that's it. Okay. Not Abimelech, Abathar. Okay. Um, so anyways, so Abathar comes to David and he brings with him the ephod. Um, and this is really important. So he has, he has gotten the, the robes of the high priest. So, and with the robes of the high priest comes the Urim and the Thummim. Um, so do you guys know what the Urim and the Thummim are? Have you heard of that before? Mm -hmm. No. Um, so the Urim and the Thummim were used by the priests to tell uh, people what God's will was. Um, and they were kept in the breastplate of the ephod. Um, so what happens in this is that when Abathar leaves, he takes off with this ephod, and so he removes from Saul the ability to, for the priests to communicate with God to tell him what he's supposed to be doing. And he takes that ability and gives it to David. So this is a very important act that takes place because now David has the ability to consult with the Lord, and Saul doesn't. Um, and so, um, and so David takes advantage of that almost immediately. And he hears about that there's this town that's being attacked. And he says, what, what do we do? He, he asks uh, Avatar to, to tell him. And so he says, yep, we'll do this. And so he pulls out the <coughs> Urim and the Thummim. Now the Urim and the Thummim, nobody knows exactly what they are. Um, but there's a couple guesses. Some people think that they were almost like dice or lots. Um, because there's a lot of times where they're using them and they're going through and saying, okay, you know, something happened and it's in one of the 12 tribes. So which tribe is it from? And then it tells them, oh, it's in the tribe of Benjamin. And then they say, okay, now which, you know, family group in Benjamin? And it says it's from this family group. And then which, you know, and it keeps going down until they get to the person, you know. Um, but then there's other times 
where they ask questions um, and it's, not, it's a more complex answer. And so um, there's other people because the word Urim means um, light and the word Thummim means perfection. And so it's perfect light. And the breastplate that it's kept in is, has these 12 gemstones on it, each representing one of the tribes of Israel. And so um, some people think that the Urim and Thummim are gemstones that somehow like cast light into things or do something. So, but there's no description of what the Urim and the Thummim are. Just we have the knowledge that the Urim and Thummim were used to make declarations from the Lord uh, to his people about what to do. And typically it was the king went and said, I need to know what to do. And then the priest said, all right, let me pull out the Urim and Thummim. They use them. And then that's the end of it. Um, and one other very interesting thing is, is that the Urim and the Thummim after David's time, we don't hear about them again. So we don't know what happened to them or if just people forgot how to use them and they were still around or we, we don't know what, what has taken place with that. But, um, but after David, you do not hear about them again. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that, Pastor Rick, about the Urim and the Thummim? No, but um, one of the things I did want to say was that the um, Saul couldn't communicate with God once Samuel left, he couldn't. Remember, he tried to get the priest to, to go through and speak, and he didn't hear anything. So that's when he, he realized he believed somebody in his army did something wrong, which was Jonathan, for eating, because he, he made nobody supposed to eat during that battle. But God didn't answer him. He blamed it on Jonathan or somebody who violated his order not to eat. But I think it was that God really wasn't answering him anyway. Mm -hmm. So whether he had the the ephod and the aluminum thermum or whatever, he wasn't, that was just, he wasn't answering him anyway. Okay. Cause that's, a, if that's after he disobeyed God. And then Samuel said, that's it. You're, you're, the kingdom's going to be torn from you. Yeah. Cause the first time he disobeyed, it was like, your kids aren't going to have the kingdom now. Someone else will. Now it's going to be ripped from you. And then Samuel went away and he couldn't communicate with God at all. And that's why he ends up going to try and raise him from the dead, because that's the only way he can communicate. That's the only way he knows how to communicate with God now. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, either way, Saul no longer has that ability to communicate with God. So, and David does. So, um, trying to think. Uh, the almond and the thermal, the only time I ever think about those things, I think the Mormons get into those things. There's something in the Book of Mormon. Oh, yeah, they, Joseph Smith said that he had the Urim and the Thummim with the golden plates. Something like that. Yeah, I knew something. I couldn't remember what the, it was. To translate yeah. the golden plates. Yeah. But, so maybe but he knows who, what they are. People who watched <laughs> him do it said he just stuck his head in a hat and talked. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, who knows? <laughs> Probably not the Urim and the Thummim. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, did either of you have any other questions about the Urim and the Thummim and about that little section there? Uh, one other thing that I thought was really interesting was that um, uh, in this chapter, Saul is running around like crazy. So the Ziphites come to him and they say, hey, we know where David is, which I think is rather uh, not helpful to themselves because David here is of the tribe of Judah and the Ziphites also are of the tribe of Judah. And yet they're basically cutting off their own foot by the guy who has an opportunity to be king could be from their tribe as opposed to from the tribe of Benjamin, yet they keep running to Saul and telling him where they're where yeah. David is at. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why. Um, and, and David writes a psalm about that. <laughs> psalm 54 is him being upset at the, the Ziphites. <laughs> um, 
But anyways, I think it's funny because the Ziphites come, tell him where David is at, and he's running all around the place trying to find David. He can't find him. But it says, but Jonathan went up to David <laughs> and knows right where David is at. <laughs> and uh, so I think that's a very interesting thing that um, Saul cannot find him, but J Jonathan is able yeah. to go right to him. Um, so, and when Jonathan comes to him, they make covenant again. So, and this is the last time that David and Jonathan get to see each other. Um, so Saul's continuing to hunt. And, um, and then all of a sudden, when he, he thinks he might be about to get to David, the Philistines come attack and he has to break off and go away, um, which Psalm writes, or David writes a Psalm about, which is Psalm 18. Um, but um, I, I, I love all this situation that occurs because in every situation, David gets the opportunity to, to basically just wait on the Lord for his salvation. And time and time and time again, you'll see through this, that David does not have to do anything other than just make sure that he stays away from the people who are trying to kill him. But, um, and sometimes not even that, um, but he, as long as he, you know, continues to go after the Lord, he, God protects him time and again, and without him having to do anything about it. So, um, so that's the end of that chapter. Um, unless anybody has anything further to say, on to the next chapter. Okay. So, um, uh, 24. Um, so, David has the opportunity at this point to take Saul's life. They're hiding in a cave. Saul comes in to use the potty. And David, his men are like, hey, this is your chance. Go kill him. And uh, David is like, I, I'm not going to kill him. Um, but he goes up and he cuts off a corner of his robe. And then once he cuts off that corner of robe, then he feels guilty about having even done that. He's like, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> even in that, I've done something wrong, he feels like. But I think that this is actually something that is completely of the Lord, that he, uh, that he did this. Because when Saul goes out of the, the, um, out of the cave and David comes out and shows him that he has this tearing of the robe, um, I think Saul gets reminded of something. So um, in 1 Samuel 15 from last week, I don't know if you remember, but after um, Saul, or after Samuel tells Saul that he is done bad by making these sacrifices and that God's going to, you know, is going to cut him off. Then Saul reaches out for Samuel's robe and rips it. And Samuel turns back and says, just as you've ripped my robe, God is going to rip the kingdom away from you. And, and it was a very distressing time for Sam or for Saul Saul, you know, gets very panicked about this and pleads with, you know, Samuel, don't leave me. Um, but he's, he's standing there holding this piece of robe. So, and, and the other thing that Samuel says during that time is he is going to give the kingdom to someone who is a better man than you. And so David comes out of this cave, is holding a piece of, Sam, of Saul's robe and says, basically, I have been a good man to you and you have been an evil man to me. And Saul's answer is very, very interesting. He, he says, uh, now I know you are more righteous than I am. You have treated me well and I have treated you badly. You have um, not just told me of the good that you did to me. You have just now told me of the good that you did to me, and the Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he not go away unharmed? Does, yeah, does he let him go away unharmed? May the Lord reward you for the way that you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. 
And now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So he, he sees him with this robe. He hears him saying, I am a better man than you. And he recognizes you're the person who's going to be given the kingdom. And then he remembers that his, he's going to be cut off. You know, him and his family are going to be cut off. So he just says, David, just swear to me that you won't do it. You aren't going to be the one to cut me off. And David says, I, I won't cut you off, you or your family. So, um, and, and David doesn't. He's very good about keeping his promises. So, um, but I, I think that that situation, you know, even though David had this grieving in his heart about having done it, I feel like it was something that was inspired by the Lord to give Saul that point of clarity um, to be able to see and recognize. Um, Oh, did anybody have anything else about that chapter? Um, yeah, that was one of the questions. I think you kind of answered it, but with the cutting of the robe, um, for some reason, um, the robe, I looked at my, this little note thing. It says the robe was symbolic of royal authority. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, I, first, I, I think I know the answer to this because I think you kind of, but there's no symbolism of the rope it wasn't like a like look it's more like i cut this off your i cut this from your robe and i could have killed you is that pretty much so it wasn't really a symbolic um like it's always been a symbolic thing <laughs> actually <laughs> no it could very well have been a symbolic thing as well because um you know robes um you know how it talks about mantles in the Bible, about people receiving mantles of things? Like when um, Elisha um, comes and follows Elijah and is given Elijah's authority, he's given Elijah's mantle. Um, and there's other times where things like that happen. And so your outer robe, a lot of times, was an identifying mark of you. Um, I think it was, um, I'm trying to remember if, uh, Judah, I think Judah just gave his signet ring and his staff, didn't he? Or did he give his, his robe also to Tamar? Do you remember, Rick? I don't remember. I can look that up real quick. Um, but I, I do know that Joseph had a robe that was a symbol, I think, of his authority, too. I think, you know, the, yeah. uh, over his brothers. I think that's why he was so upset about, and the brothers were so upset about getting the robe. Yeah, and there's other times. I mean, robes are considered to be identifying marks of people. Kind of like a uniform, like in the military or something like that. Yeah, except for instead of being a uniform, it was each person's was different, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, like, because you didn't have a ton of clothes back then. So, you know, your, your out, outer coat was your outer coat. So everybody, when they saw, you know, the person with the orange stripe in their back or whatever, that was, you know, this person or, you know, and so it was an identifying mark of who you were. And that was actually something that they did when they did these covenants a lot of times is they would switch robes so that if someone saw you from afar, they would actually think that you were the person who you would switch robes with, um, you know, so that they knew, you know, this is, you know, we are we are the same um so so that would have been potentially a thing of that could have been part of the reason why david felt such regret it wasn't just that he had cut off a, cor a piece of material off of somebody's clothing you know it it was a a, a cutting off of his authority you oh know, okay. it was simple so I Judah think left the, the cord, by the way, the cord that he wrapped around his cloak, the cord, the seal, and his staff. Okay. All right. So, but, yeah, so it was, but the robe, I think, did have more importance than just a piece of clothing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Um, oh, uh, there is also, I think, a couple other <clears throat> psalms with this chapter. Um, psalm 57 and Psalm 142 are connected to um, a Saul and David's interaction there. 
um, that David writes about what happened to him. Going to need a bigger piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. David has a lot of extra extraneous stuff connected to him. So, um, so next you have a Samuel 25. Um, so, and this is the story of Nabal and Ab Abigail. Um, Nabal, which funny enough means the fool. Um, and he is also a uh, descendant of Caleb, which is what the Ziphites are. They're the descendants of Caleb. Um, and so he's also a person from Judah. Um, and David's men were protecting his herd. And then when David hears that he's uh, at his time where he's shearing sheep, which is typically when you then, you know, slaughter a few sheep and have a big party, um, he goes and asks for some food for having taken such good care of the sheep during that time period. And Nabal refuses that of him. Um, and so David gets pretty upset about that. Um, but this is another situation again where um, God intervenes and he sends Abigail um, to go intervene and keep David from slaughtering basically his brethren because, you know, they're of the same tribe. And instead God kills Nabal for his, uh, for his foolishness. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, again, it just consistently David is protected during this time period uh, where God is the one taking vengeance for him. God is the one protecting him. God is the one who is doing the runaround for him. Um, a couple other things do happen in this chapter. Samuel dies. Um, and so everybody starts mourning for that. Um, and then we also find out that um, David's wife, who is uh, Saul's daughter, Michael, is uh, given to another man um, to become her husband. And so David ends up taking two other wives, um, Abigail being one of them. Um, and so he, yeah, he has these other um, wives to take the place of Michael. Um, I don't know. I didn't find much in that one to really talk about. So what, did you guys have any questions on that chapter or I thought it was pretty straightforward. I do wonder what, why some things that just seem so horrible are, is God doesn't ever say anything to David about taking on extra wives. I mean, even like taking his first wife from the man she was with. I mean, she was obviously happy and he wasn't going to spend any time with her the rest of her life. So why bother? I, why make her miserable? I, I don't get it. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I just wonder, we'll see you next time, you know, when, when the, the, the cart holding the Ark of the Covenant and the guy tries to stop it, you know, from falling to the ground, he dies instantly because he's being irreverent. But, you know, the showbread, you know, it's not a problem. <laughs> you know, it just, I don't understand, you know, God is just not very predictable. <laughs> And w back in the, the days, was it, was it normal for them to have more? I mean, I'm sure it was, but, you know, I guess because I'm like, oh, he has now two wives. And I always thought he had just one. Oh, he had a bunch. Yeah, he has a lot of wives. And yeah. then Solomon beats him by far, but <clears throat> yeah, and he ends up with like, what, like a dozen wives or something no, like that? No, more than that. It's like 70 or something. I'll, I'll check real quick here. It's a lot. Like he has more than 70 years. wives. Yeah. Wow. He, you know, he ends up marrying for, um, you know, how they marry sometimes to make treaties and stuff like that. So he, he does that sort of thing, which God tells them specifically not to do. So right. this is definitely, I mean, and you can tell this is definitely one of David's weaknesses is women. You know, I mean, you get that concept with Bathsheba and you get it with, you know, the fact that all these women, you know, and he's supposed to, that's one of the things that the, the kings are supposed to do is they're supposed to memorize scripture. They, they one of the th first things that a king is supposed to do is write their own scroll of scripture. That's one of the things that the Bible tells them to do. And so, you know, if 
if David has done this, you know, at least later on, he would have had to write, you know, that kings are to only have one wife. And they definitely are not to marry anyone outside of, in, out of Israel. Um, you know, because it says if you do this, that you're going to be led astray, um, which is exactly what happens with, with Solomon. Solomon gets led astray by having all these different wives. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's David's downfall, his women. He, he likes his women. So, so do you find how many wives he has yet, Rick? One says eight, another one has something else. And I thought that was like he had a lot. So I'm I'm going to have to, it's giving me, take me a moment. So I'll come back. Just go on. I'll keep yeah. looking. I was thinking like 12 or 14, but I don't know. I wonder if uh, he, well, he really had a bunch of concubines as well. Oh. <clears throat> what were you saying, Joanna? I said, I wonder if he really knows all their names. <laughs> hey, you. <laughs> Well, it depends upon if he has eight or if he has 70, so. <laughs> yep. Uh, Any thoughts from you, Rod? No. I. No. The only thing I found interesting in that was, well, I found parts interesting, but the one in, I think it was 2530, it was where it got, like, really confusing with the Lord – the capital L, lowercase L, and then God and all that stuff. It was, you know, we, we had talked about it enough that it all kind of flowed, but like I had to read it twice. There were sentences that had Lord, Lord, God, Lord, Lord, God, God, Lord, Lord. But that was, other than that, it, and the fact that a woman, you know, for how they talked about how women played the slow, low role back then, how she, you know, basically saved him. And then, like like Rick said, he ends up taking her for a wife in the end. So that was the only interesting stuff I saw in there. Yeah. I It doesn't say, I guess the Bible doesn't say exactly how many wives or concubines David had, but they know he had many because, well, first of all, his, his son took several of them that he left some of his concubines behind when his when his uh, son tried to take the kingdom from him, when yeah. Absalom tried to take the king, and he used them on the roof in front of everybody in a tent. So there, that wasn't all of his concubines, but I don't know how many concubines and how many wives. It doesn't say, you know, there's at least eight for sure, but it doesn't say exactly how many. I, I always thought he had like more than 70, but apparently it doesn't say. Okay. Oh, there's something we need there. Our son was having a, a moment that he needed some help. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay. Um all right, so on to chapter 26, I guess. So um, in this one, um, David goes with Abishai, I think is his name. Um, he's the brother of Joab, and Joab is going to be someone who's going to be really important here in the next uh, couple weeks uh, with David, so keep him in mind. Um, and they go down into Saul's camp. Um, to go see what's going on, and uh, I, they, it says God put them in a deep sleep, and I, I think this is kind of a funny situation reading through this because it's like Abishai and and David are sitting there having this argument while they're standing over Saul's head, deciding what they're going to do. You know, <laughs> I think I don't want to kill him kind of gutsy because they don't know that God put them all to sleep, you know, so they're standing there with, you know, like the, the head of his army and Saul and all these people and they're having this argument about what they're going to do with the spear, you know, and <laughs> it just cracks me up as, to, you know, them doing that and potentially how brave Daniel and Abishai are for having done this. Um, but he, Daniel just takes, or Daniel, David uh, takes his um, his spear and his 
his water jug and takes off with them and goes to a high hill and then um, and, and he again refuses to kill God's anointed. And I think that this is something as David continues to go through this and he you know, he, again, he has this blessing from God that he is going to be king, and yet he refuses to take it. You know, he he's waiting for God to give it to him. He is not going to go in and usurp or take or overthrow um, or kill. He says, nope, that's God's anointed. And I think that this is part of the reason why he has God's heart, because he's not um, itching try to take over he's not going to try to take a hold of the reins he's stepping back he's saying i know i have this promise but i'm going to let god decide the timing i'm going to let god decide how it happens and i'm not going to try to make it happen in my power um and what an incredible thing you know particularly when time and time again this opportunity is being handed to him on a silver plate of you could just end it all right here. You could end all of your misery and suffering of being chased around by this evil man, you know, who you know is demon possessed <laughs> and who is a bad king. And you could just kill him and and take on the anointing that God has already said he's given you. And yet he turns that down. And that I, I think that that just shows the humility and the the submittedness of David to God in an incredible way. I, th I think that this is one of the biggest problems in American society today is that when people are ro risen up and have that power being given to them by the Lord to do something, you know, they get into ministry or whatever, so many of them end up falling because they try to grasp it and do it of their own power or their own ability instead of allowing God to be the one to take charge and just waiting on him for what he wants to do and his timing of when he wants to do it. So, um, yeah. So that was that chapter to me. Uh, any thoughts for you guys? No, I just think it's like patience too. Like he knows it's coming, you know, and just showing... You know, I don't know if he's necessarily showing restraint, but I'm um, like, but he's just, you know, like you said, submitting to God and like he knows it has to be God's timing and not his, you know, and plus he probably just seen what Saul went through, you know, and how, how um, Saul just dismiss, dismisses everything about God and what God's plan is or anything doesn't, you know, I think he just sees Saul and he's probably thinking, I don't want to be like that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I do find it interesting I'm, that in 26, 21, where, you know, after he doesn't kill him again, that Saul tries to get David to come back with him. You know, this is like the, what, how many times did he try and kill him before he ran? Like two, and then he chased him. You know, so now David's not killing him, and Saul wants him to come back. It just, I find it interesting that he pleads for him to, you know, forgive him and come back with him, that he won't do it again. Yeah. Yeah, and at least David is wise and doesn't do that. You know, he doesn't go back with them. But yeah, I think, you know, um, Mike, when Mike was reading it, he was talking about how Saul is the most wishy-washy man oh yeah. <laughs> and, and how he was, you know, so back and forth. And I said, you know, I feel like what part of the issue is with Saul is, you know, we know he is being tormented by these demons, you know, and he has this fear inside of him about the fact that, you know, his, his kingdom and his family is going to be, you know, torn down and ripped away. So he's like panicking because he knows he's upset God. So he's like trying to grab and hang on to whatever he can. But at the same time, he constantly has these things that happen where he gets hit with these bouts of guilt and remorse, you know? And so then he's like, oh my gosh, I'm this horrible person. How did I become this? You know? And so he has these dual natures i think possibly three natures of this possession the 
selfishness and fear and then the guilt and remorse that are all tearing at him and so it's you know depending upon which facet he has coming out at the time is what kind of Saul you get you know so you, you can't trust the man because he's you never know which which personality you're going to be dealing with next you know maybe David feels sorry for him yeah yeah it could be could be so I think one of the things I wonder about is is um <laughs> If you look at like our own culture, like the president can only be president for how long? Eight, Eight, years. Eight years, right? Yeah. And let's just say our president decided that he won and then he wants to run a third time. Wouldn't there be outrage in our, because our culture is set up. You can't, you can only be twice. You're not going to, you know, try and run multiple times. It's so set and ingrained in the way we think of what's right and wrong. I think one of the things that David does here when, um, when he refuses to take the life of Saul and make himself king by refusing to harm the Lord's anointed is, is, is doing something very different from the culture of the Middle East, right? Because even as you go through the books, the, the idea is if you can kill the king, make yourself king, right? And that happens over, and it still happens in the world. You know, you just, a, a general assassinates a president and becomes president until he's assassinated. I, I mean, Argentina over and over and over and over and over. And so by not doing this, I think he sets, he's, I think he's, what he's doing is setting up a ideal that the Lord's anointed as king. And just because you can kill him doesn't make you king. Um, God's in control of who's king. Just, just a thought, you know, that that just becomes something you don't do in Israel is kill the Lord's anointed because David started that. And in our country, the first, first president was George Washington who said only two terms, which the rest of the world was shocked that he didn't want to become king. And then um, when Roosevelt did run a third and fourth terms, there were people that were upset, even though it wasn't the law. It was like, you don't do this. And so as soon as he died, they're like, yeah, we're going to change this so that nobody does this again. So you just kind of wonder whether, I don't know whether, yeah, I don't know, but it, it just seems to be something that happens you know obviously then when he becomes king no one's going to touch the lord's anointing because that's what he's kind of instilled just some thoughts i don't know if it's true or not yeah that's an interesting set of thoughts mm -hmm. all right any other thoughts on this set of chapter in this chapter all right so uh david after his lovely invitation by Saul, decides, let's go back to the Philistines. <laughs> I have a better chance with them than with crazy. Um, <laughs> so he heads back into Philistine territory. Um, so, and the king there ends up giving him a, uh, a town of his own, Ziklag, which it says uh, ends up being with the, the kings of Israel from there on out. Um, so, and, uh, during that time period, he goes out raiding. Um, it says mainly he ends up fighting against, uh, three different, uh, na nationalities, um, two of which they don't really know much at all about. Um, but one of them is the Amalekites, which is the, the group that God told them that they are to be eternally at war with and to kill forever. <laughs> So uh, David followed through on what God told them to do as Israelites to kill the Amalekites. Um, but he is very wary of telling this to the king. So he tells the king that he's been going to the different Negevs to kill uh, or to, to plunder. Um, so I, uh, I was curious because, um, you know, it's, it, he's talking about Negev, 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 Negev. And so I'm going, what, what is Negev? So I looked that up and it's a place that it, it literally means dry hills. Um, and they said what it uh, probably meant was like a region uh, uh, surrounded with hills. Um, so, and they believe that most of the places that are referred to as Negev were in the southern part or south of Israel or the southern part of Israel. So 
he was telling them he was going basically into the territories of Judah um, to plunder. And, but instead he was going further south of that to go hunt Amalekites and Gershurites or whatever their names were. So, um, I don't know. I didn't get much out of that chapter. Anybody have any questions out of that one? It's just weird that he would go to the Philistines, you know, and then, I mean, and the Philistines would accept him. It's just bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, especially with how much he had killed them off in, that, in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that he had come there, lived before, pretended to be insane, and, you know, <laughs> and then he came back with, like, 600 men, and is like, okay, well, I'm not insane. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But. All right. Any other thoughts on that chapter? Because now we're going to go on to the chapter that certain people are going to have a ton of questions about or thoughts on. <laughs> the Witch of Endor. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, again, another, at the start of this chapter, another point where David has to really trust God because the king comes to him and says, all right, I'm going to war against Israel and you are going to be my bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's crazy. And, and David's response is kind of like, well, now you can see how good I am. You know, it's <laughs> like, what, what is he? I, I just, I wonder what David's actual plan was because I think, I don't, you know, he's worked so hard to not fight the Israelites and the king thinks he has been fighting them this entire time, you know? And so I just, I don't know what his plan was, but God definitely steps in to help him out in this area. So, um, but that comes later on. So Saul is trying to find out what to do. And so he, goes to see a medium um, to call up Saul. Um, and this is a big no-no. Um, it actually mentions that Saul had actually done one thing right, which is he had gone through the land and killed all the witches in the land, <laughs> all the mediums, all the sorcerers, all that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if you guys are interested in where uh, this is at, but um, in Leviticus 19, verse 31, and in chapter 20, verses 6 and 27, um, God gives the order that they are not to have anything to do with these people and that they're to kill them. Um, and he says, and their blood will be on their own heads. And they said, and if you do something with them, that you will be defiled. Uh, the word there is to actually be made unclean. Um, so or polluted by them. Um, so I, I, I think what his thought is, is that it pollutes your soul, but then it also, you know, you're unclean for interacting with the Lord, which there are potentially sacrifices for that, but only if you did it unintentionally. Um, so I don't know how you would unintentionally go and get your fortune told by someone. I didn't intend to see them, <laughs> but anyway, um, but then also in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 13, it gives the biggest uh, warning about this. So I want to read that one. It's like, I'm going to change my glasses so I can read better. So it says, um, when you enter the land of the Lord your God, the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. 
So he's saying specifically it's because of these practices that he is um, having them kill all the Canaanites um, and the people who live there and all the other, you know, the, all the other people who live there. Um, and that's one of the things it talks about, I think, in the book of Enoch is that the, um, uh, the Nephilim, you know, who are all throughout this area, um, that they very specifically taught uh, the people and specifically the daughters how to do witchcraft um, and how to do all these different things that involve that sort of stuff. Um, they taught them about metallurgy, it says. It taught them about, they taught them about um, using herbs um, and, and roots and things like that. Um, and so they, they teach them all these different things that are quote unquote witchcraft. Um, and I, I actually went through the Hebrew. I don't know if you guys are interested in this as to what it was specifically that they were supposed to stay away from. But, um, but the witch of Endor, she is one that is called Baal Ob, um, so, um, which was specifically um, uh, translated as witch. But what it means in the Hebrew is master of the spirits or lord of the spirits. And, um, and it also indicates um, uh, there's a, another set of words that are connected with it uh, in the Greek, and that would be uh, gastromancy, which means uh, magic from the stomach. Um, and so the concept of it was, is that people who were Baal or Baal orb, um, that they would have spirits enter into them, into their, into their gut. Um, which that's where it said that your spirit is located at, your spirit is located at, is in your stomach area, was the Middle Eastern concept. Um, and um, that they would come into there and then the person would have the ability to communicate with them. And basically, um, it sounds like, I don't know if you guys have heard much about like, um, <sighs> like people who practice like voodoo or some of these ancestral type worship type things where these spirits will come into people and then they'll start manifesting these spirits. Like women will slither on the ground like snakes or, you know, do all this stuff. And then they'll just start speaking out um, in these strange voices. And that'll be the spirit of the, you know, whatever it is that they got. Um, and it will communicate through their body um, and take over their body, communicate through them, and then when it's done, then it, it leaves, and then the person goes back to being their normal selves. Um, and so it seems like this is what she is. She's one of these people who allows spirits to come into her and projects them, and then, you know, then they leave, and then he, um, then she goes back to being herself. Um, and it's very interesting in the encounter um, when it talks about what happens, you know, it says that um, uh, when, when the spirit comes into her, um, first of all, it says that she raw oz the spirit, which do you guys remember earlier? Gad was a seer, a raw aw. And so she is a seer Me. also. She is, Me. you know, so she's Hi. seeing things. In the, Daniel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so she's seen in the spiritual realm. Um, and then it's very interesting what she sees. Because um, what she says is, um, I see Elohim coming up, um, climbing out of the ground. Um, so she's saying she's seen a God climbing out of the ground. Um, and, and that that's what she sees. And then, um, Saul asks her further and then she says, uh, an old man in a robe. And then he's like, okay, that's, that's Samuel. And then they interact. Um, and, and you'll see it's, you know, Saul is saying something and then Samuel is saying something. And so I think what's happening at this point is that that spirit has 
basically taken over her. And so then she's interacting with it. Um, now, is this actually Samuel? Is it another spirit imitating Samuel? What's happening here? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how the spirit realm works well enough to know what actually took place there. Um, because it seems rather odd that God would let Samuel come and possess another person, you know. Um, That's what I was thinking. I'm like, why would God allow that yeah. to happen? I mean, why, you know, and, and of course I'm like, does it happen? You know, I mean, you see weird stuff on television and whatever. And, you know, it is kind of like, I really don't believe in that, you know. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily true or not. Just like, are there aliens, you know? Is there really ghosts, <laughs> you know? I mean, this can somebody was, really... You know, sorry. This was back in a time when, like, what appeared to be supernatural stuff did happen, though, you know, for God to get his point across. And when it says in 17 that Samuel basically said to Saul, the Lord has done what he predicted through me, the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to your neighbors. Maybe, maybe it truly is a vision of Samuel saying, Hey, this is like, he allowed the vision to happen to say, okay, this happened just like what I told you it would. Yeah. yeah I mean, and two, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting to me is, you know, God is saying, don't allow these people to, to interact with you guys. And he doesn't say it's, it's a lie or that it doesn't happen. He, he's saying these people really are evil and don't, don't do what they're doing. Hmm. So I, I mean, I think that the Bible indicates that these things are real and that they can happen. Um, just the question is, is what we see happening, what's yeah. actually happening in my mind, you know, uh, yeah. because we do see at other points, God talking to yeah. spirits, you know, and saying, all right, you yeah. can go out and do this and say this, yeah. you know, um, like it says in one point, he's talking to the spirits in heaven and he says, I need a lying spirit to go into the mouths of the prophets. And the spirit's like, okay, I could do that, you know. And so it goes out and becomes a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets. It's actually know? the spirit makes the suggestion. That's, That's what right. I can do. I can be a lying spirit, and God says, go do that, you know. And I, I think that a lot of times, and I've been guilty of this too, is like discrediting all supernatural stuff unless it's demonic, or like unless it's unless it's demons, or whether or whether it comes from God. But I think there's there's things that we that are beyond our understanding that we shouldn't be meddling with, and God tries to protect us from those things. And the uh, the so-called watchers that you know I think Jacqueline brought up were teaching things that we weren't supposed to be dabbling in, and uh, they but they're real. You know I think that was Samuel. I you know it makes sense to me um, that it was Samuel. If it was a demonic spirit, you think the demonic spirit would be speaking the truth <laughs> I think it wouldn't have any any bearing on chastising Saul for abandoning God I I think uh, I think it was Samuel but that's just my opinion yeah I, I personally I think that it could be a, a spirit that's not Samuel that God you know says I will allow you to go but this is the requirement. You have to say these things, you know, um, because I think God has the ability to control what spirits can do. I, I think he can, you know, curtail things and say, you, you are not. Oh, I mean, spirit. obviously he's, there are spirits that have a will of their own or they wouldn't have left him, you know? So, yeah. you know, so he can, they can do, do things on their own too. So, way i think we see you but there's different ways to look at it you know so i and i know it's a very confusing chapter but i think the thing that is important to understand is that it really is a possibility that something supernatural did take place here 
and that when you are dealing with mere mediums and spiritists and that kind of stuff, you are dealing with a real issue, um, with a, a real problem. Um, uh, one of the things I was thinking was interesting. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard any information about this, but um, uh, in just hearing about what's happening in society today, um, uh, the Black Lives Matters leaders um, have talked about the fact that they are voodoo, um, that they, they specifically practice voodoo. Um, and one of the things that they specifically talk about doing is when they go to these places that they want to start protesting in, that one of the first things that they do is they do this ceremony and they get the crowd to start to chant or murmur the name of people, who, the names of the black people who have died. And they just repeat them over and over and over again. And that is actually one of the things that's specifically um, talked about in, um, in Deuteronomy that you're not to do. Um, it talks about the murmurers who deal with the dead um, and murmuring names and, and necromancy. Um, and so, you know, here it is where I'm sitting here reading this thing that's, you know, talking to people, you know, back in, you know, like 1500 BC, and yet they're in modern day, you know, there, there's a, a modern movement of people who, you know, most people probably aren't thinking anything of this, but yet they're practicing this exact same thing that there is a, a thing that they're told not to do, you know, um, as they're going in. And so I think that that's where some of the stuff is coming from, you know, as, as that there, there's actual witchcraft being practiced um, by some of these groups. And then that is um, adding to the uh, lack of, uh, good choices being made by some of these crowds, I guess is the way I would put it, <laughs> um, where we're ending in issues of death and destruction. Um, so uh, very interesting things to look at as far as what to, what God is saying. Where did, you, where, where did you find that article? Was it just like, where did you, where did you see the, the, art, the article that you read about that? Oh, it was an interview with the leaders. And they were talking. Oh, it about was. It. Oh, huh, huh. Yeah. So they were actually. Hey, you it. Yeah, they 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 were very open about it. Oh, really? Huh. huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you look up um, voodoo background of them or whatever, I'm certain you'll find it. I'm certain you'll find it because it's all over YouTube. Huh. So. Yeah. Hmm. That's they, uh, me. Oh yeah, they're very, very, uh, very much excited about the fact that they're. They're trained Marxists. Uh, they, they, they talk about being trained Marxists and also that they are specifically practicers, practice, practitioners of voodoo. So, and then, yeah, as I said, they talk about specifically what voodoo practices they do when they go to these different sites. So it's just a regular interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <it's> crazy. <laughs> So. Yeah, I, I'm gonna look that up. I've never heard that. That was that's new. Yeah, I, I haven't either. Consider disturbing, yeah. but yeah, mm. yeah. Um, one other interesting thing I think that happens in this chapter um, is that Saul, or Samuel, specifically tells Saul that he and his sons will be with him that day, and I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means that they're going to be in death or if that means that they're going to be with him in heaven um because the other time i can think of someone saying you're going to be with me it's jesus talking to a guy on a cross um and so i i just kind of wonder what that is and i i think about that and i think you know you could think jonathan yeah he's probably you know going to be in heaven but saul you know with all this stuff that he's done all this evil that he's done and yet he still did believe in the lord so what does that mean you know and is he going to be one of the people in heaven that came through 
you know, it talks about in uh, some of the Bible verses about that you can get into heaven basically through the fire with nothing except for yourself, you know, like your clothes and everything like that will be burnt off, which, you know, I'm guessing that they're talking spiritually, um, you know, or, yeah, you know, there's just a lot of questions in my mind as to what did that mean that you will be with me, you know, at, at the end of today, mm -hmm. the end of the battle. So, um, are there any other thoughts or questions about this? Okay. Um, all right. So chapter 29. Um, all right. So um, I guess chapter 29, David is found faithful and without fault, even by the Philistine king. Um, the other ones don't trust him because they recognize he's an Israelite, but nobody can actually say exactly why they don't trust him. So um, I, David is just found to be a really particularly good guy. Um, he, the other thing I guess I should say about David that he doesn't do right necessarily, although I don't know if it's right or wrong in this thing, is he very much lies a lot throughout this journey to try to keep himself out of trouble. You know, he, he lies about, you know, going and killing Israelites. He lies about that he's on an important trip from, um, from Saul. He, he, you know, lies about that he's insane. He just, he, he's caught lying a lot um, in these times to try to stay out of trouble. Um, and that is not a situation of trusting the Lord. Um, but I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say about this chapter other than that. Um, so, I mean, the king believes that he's a great guy and that he hasn't done anything wrong, but at the same time, he's been lying to the king the whole time. So, I don't know. <laughs> Are there any other thoughts on that chapter? No, it's just really not a surprise when they get down to it and the other leaders are like, we, you know, we want you to go instead of fighting with us. I mean, it, it's... Makes not, sense. Yeah, it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise that... <laughs> they got to that point before someone stood their ground and says, we don't want this guy fighting with us. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't know what's going to happen if he's going to turn on us. You know, and I don't know if that would have been David's plan had he not been turned away. You know, I, I don't know what would have happened there. So, cause I can't imagine David being okay with killing a bunch of Israelites. So, um, but this ends up, freeing up David to go back in chapter 30 and kill a bunch of Amalekites, which is who he is supposed to be killing. So um, <laughs> they, uh, they come through and torch his town and take off with all of his people and all of his stuff. And uh, he is really sad about it and then says, wait a minute, we have the ephod. Let's find out what God wants us to do. So they pull out the good old Urim and Thummim and find out that God says, you can overtake them, go get them. So he does. Um, the other interesting thing I think in this chapter is that he's, I mean, again, he's leading a band to troublemakers, you know? So he has these people that are causing them, you know, you know that are, it says evil specifically in the Bible, that they are, are specifically troublemakers. And so they don't want to give the uh, loot to the people who were tired out and stayed behind to watch the supplies. And David says, nope, we're going to make sure to, to take care of everyone. And so they, uh, he evenly redistributes the possessions. And then he also has some extra loot that he sends off to the people who have helped them the entire time that they've been hiding throughout Judah. So, um, yeah, so he's trying to be really good to people. Um, any thoughts about that chapter? I got a question when it said, um, um, like in 30:16, and also in 19, it says David. It just says Dave. This is David's spoil, and then it says the great spoil. Um, like nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. And then at the end of that, 
paragraph that says, this is David's spoil. So I'm like, what's, what is that? I don't know what that. My version says plunder. Plunder? Yeah, that's what my version says is plunder. Hmm. Well, tell me again where you're reading at. What chapter, um, what verse? Chapter, oh, verse. Um, oh, 16, he said. Verse 19. 19, it says, nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that has been taken. And then down on 20, um, at the very end, after it captures the flocks and the herds and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. <laughs> it's the spoils of war. It's, it's plunder. It's, you ever heard of the spoils of war? Mm -mm. Yeah, the spoils of war is when you you basically get the weapons, you get whatever the guys are carrying. Throughout, especially ancient times, you know, if even Americans, when World War II, you watch them just plundering the Germans, taking art, taking silverware and dishes and sending it just back. Just taking possessions. Cities. Other people, yeah, that's off the deck. Tons of German weapons made it back to the United States with soldiers. Mm -hmm. It's this, it's called the spoils of war. Oh, okay, never heard that before. <clears throat> yeah, so they what he's saying is nothing that they had been plundered from them was missing, and then they took everything, including what had been theirs, and then what extra they had, and they put it all in front of David and said, See, see all the greatness that he has. This is everything that David won. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions about that chapter? Nope. Okay. Rick, so, do you have uh, any questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's some things I've learned. Now. <laughs> what? There's some things I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> um, so finally, uh, the final chapter, Saul takes his life. So, um, yeah, so Saul uh, is fighting, and as God tells him, uh, his sons end up being killed in the battle. Um, and then Saul realizes this, realizes that he's been mortally well, he's been wounded, not mor not mortally. He's been wounded by archers. Um, and he recognizes, you know, in previous chapters, we've seen some of the things that they've done to kings where they like to capture them and parade them around and, you know, mock them and that sort of stuff. And so Saul is afraid of having this happen to himself. Um, Samson, they gouge his eyes out. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. So, you know, they, there's a lot of th cruel things that they do to people where they keep them almost like pets in their, um, their court, um, but keep, make them impotent in some way so that they're not able to do anything to overpower them. And so he doesn't want to be uh, disgraced in that way. And so he uh, asks his armor bearer to kill him and his armor bearer won't do it. So then he kills himself. And then his uh, armor bearer recognizes no! the fact that his master got killed on his watch. And so then he kills himself because he feels probably wouldn't be good to be caught alive after that. Um, so, and then uh, they pretty much, they slaughter him, hang him up uh, as a warning to what happens to people who deal with Philistines. And then uh, we have the people of uh, uh, what Jabesh Gilboa or whatever its name is, Jabesh Gilead, um, which I think, do you guys remember them from last week? They were uh, the people that um, Saul was living with. Yep. Um, so when he went and slaughtered his cattle and went out to go protect the people that he, when he became king. So, and they come and rescue his body and, and bury it under the tamarisk tree, which it sounds like the Jabesh Gilead, Jabesh Gilead isn't where he was living. That's the town that was under siege. And then, and, and Saul rescued them. I thought it was, 
I thought it was the other way around. Let's see no, it, no, that's the city that, that he was he was rescuing when he cut up the, the he's from Gibeon or whatever is where he was or Gibeah or whatever and he cut up the oxygen oxen because Jabeth Jabesh Gilead was um, under siege and they wanted to take out the right eye of each guy or whatever. Um, and they said, let us send a message. And if nobody, if nobody comes, then, okay. um, then we'll, we'll surrender. So sure. what? They said, you're right. You're right. Yeah. It's an important city though. I talked about it last week was Jabesh Gilead was also the city uh, that was destroyed by the Benjamites or by the all the Israelites to give the Benjamites some wives, and so Saul would have probably been a descendant of Gib Jabesh Gilead through you know the women, yeah. But because he rescued that city, that's why they went rescued their lives and re got his bo their bones, you know, got them and buried them because he rescued them, so yeah. So, so he and his sons got buried under a tree, and so he's, yeah. So that was what happened to him in the end. And David never had to kill anybody. Well, not anybody. David never had to kill Saul <laughs> or his sons. <laughs> the end. Yeah. Gonna kill a few more people, I think. Yeah, he, he killed, well, what, tens of thousands of uh, Philistines? He's going to uh, kill more. I mean, he's going to kill more. He's going to kill the guy that brings him the news of Saul's death, and that's yeah. next week. Yep. So, so. anyway. But, any questions on uh, Saul's death um, or that chapter? On the, I don't know if you, like, Rick and I have this, that same Bible, the, the ESV, mm -hmm. and on the notes, it says, um, it says Saul took his own sword and fell upon it, and then it says, "See notes, Second um, Samuel one, uh, chapter one, six through ten. I know we're not there yet, but and it claims that Saul did not in there. I guess I guess I'm kind of jumping ahead. It says Saul did um, did not commit suicide, but rather was killed by the Amalekite. I'm not sure how you say. <laughs> He attempted to commit suicide, yeah, and then that, yeah, that comes up next week. In okay. The, yeah, I mean, he attempted to kill suicide, commit suicide. That was his intent. So, but yeah, then, and he would have died if he just, the other guy just sped up his death. So he really didn't kill himself then? He did. It just he that. Did. Yeah, another guy came and sped up the, the process. So, oh, like, okay. if you cut your veins open, you're you're dying. There's no way it's too late. And I decided to put you out of your misery and cut your head off. Okay, I killed you, but you really did kill yourself. It's okay. kind of like See, I had, well, I mean, it's part of next week's, but I had always thought that that was, um, that the guy was lying. That right. And that's actually done it. And then he ended up dying for his lie. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Um, I don't know. If, I'll, I'll have to study that. I'd never heard that before. That's what I thought when I read it. I, I read through it going, well, we just read the other part and it said he killed himself. And now you're saying right. you killed him and now you're going to die for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, so I, says, I don't he know. Says, though, like, that he, he says that he, he, I, well, we'll look at it next week. We'll look at it next week. I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Rick, do you want to pray for us to close? Sure. Father in heaven, I thank you for Jacqueline's willingness to do the research and be prepared to lead this this week. And it's a tremendous help to me. I thank you for those um, who are able to participate. And I pray you bless this uh this time of study and um, for those who are going to listen um, throughout the week as many people watch these videos Lord I pray that, I pray that it's a blessing to them and you would teach us the things we need to know about your word uh, we just thank you for it in Jesus name amen amen thank you Jacqueline you yeah, did great you. yeah good I'm glad